we're often told by Muslims that they have the perfect word of God, the Quran, preserved without error, without contradiction, whereas we have thousands of manuscripts of the Greek New Testament, thousands of manuscripts through the centuries of the Hebrew Bible, and various textual errors, contradictions, and things like that, whereas they have the one and only perfect word, perfectly preserved. How do you respond? Multiple ways, because there are multiple problems um, with that claim. Um, one, part of the reason that we have lots of textual variants and so on is because we have so many manuscripts, right? We have thousands of manuscripts handwritten, and the more manuscripts the ha you have, the more variants you're going to have. So if we had 10,000 handwritten copies of the Constitution, we didn't have the original Constitution, mm -hmm. but we had 10,000 handwritten copies. You're going to expect a few errors here and there, yep. but if you examine the 10,000, mm -hmm. it's like, wow, we got a lot of evidence. You yeah. can pretty well get the exact original text. Yeah, and notice the way that you would avoid having any variant is to just have one. And somehow in the Islamic mindset, that's better. Just burn all of them, which is, by the way, is what they did with their scriptures. Just burn all of them and only have one, and now you have no differences, right? So you're saying they had lots of variations of, of what the Quran was? Yeah, that goes back to the first generation of Muslims. So, so, so on the one hand, on the one hand, their, their objection to their claim that we have all these variants, that's true, but it's because we have tons of handwritten manuscripts, and that's what, that's what you're going to have. So it's... Because we have so many manuscripts, which is a good thing, yeah. because the more manuscripts you have, the more you can compare them with one another and get back to the original. Um, but second, one, you can look at Quran manuscripts today, and there are, there are books filled with, with, with Quran variants and so on. Um, but even this goes back to the, the first generation of Muslims. So Muhammad died, there was no complete Quran. The, pe people had passages memorized, they had written them down on, written parts down on bones, on leaves, on rocks, and so on. And people start going around, they're quoting the Quran. Uh, an interesting event happens. Um, there was a battle, and Abu Bakr was the first, of the first you know, Muslim caliph after Muhammad died. So Abu Bakr sends all these Muslims who you know, had parts of the Quran memorized into battle, and they get slaughtered. And so they lost parts of the Quran. The Muslim sources say that they couldn't, they knew that these guys had parts of the Quran memorized, and not one person knew what these, what these verses were after them. So they lost parts of the Quran. And so Abu Bakr said, we need a, a written copy so that we don't lose any more of it. And that way, you know, no matter how many of us die in battle, we still got a written copy. So it's just amazing that the entire purpose of making the Quran into one book was that so, men, so much of it was already lost that they're trying to avoid losing more. Mm. But then, now that they start, you know, uh, uh, now that you know, people are, are, are writing it down, people are writing down their own, their own editions and so on, a few decades, a couple decades later, Uthman, who's the third of the rightly guided caliphs, he starts getting complaints that there are all these differences. There are all these differences in different editions of the Quran that people, people are you know, putting together and compiling for themselves. So he comes up with a solution. He tells uh, Zayd ibn Thabit to put together an official version of the Quran, and then Uthman orders everyone to burn everything else. So mm. he burns all of the evidence. Now notice, that's why I said that's, that's the Islamic mindset. Right. What's important is the unity, not truth, right? It's, it's kind of like when you have an election in Russia and you have one candidate running. Yeah. And he yeah. gets all the votes. Yeah, what so, does that prove? Yeah, so Uthman puts out the official Quran, orders his followers to burn everything else. Now notice, according to, uh, according to what Muslims believe, that there's never, you know, the Quran's been perfectly preserved right down to the letter. Wh what's the problem with all those? They should have all lined up perfectly. Right. They didn't. He had to burn them to cover that up. And it's even after that, even after that, that there's a completely standardized Quran. It's a completely standardized Quran. Um, they still end up with tons of, tons of variants over, over the centuries. And, 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 and this is... The problem was so bad, they couldn't even agree during that time. They couldn't even agree on which chapters were supposed to be in the Quran. Muhammad told his followers, if you want to learn the Quran from anyone, learn it from these four people. And he named, he named four people, two of the people on his list, Ubay ibn Kab and Ibn Masud. Ibn Masud, his Quran only had 111 chapters. The Quran we have today has 114. He didn't believe that Surah 1, Surah 113, or Surah 114 are even supposed to be in the Quran. He said, these are prayers we pray. They're not, they're not, they're not the Quran. This is us talking to Allah. It's not Allah talking to us. Um, so he said those aren't supposed to be in there. Ubay ibn Kaab, another person on Muhammad's list of, if you want to learn the Quran from anyone, learn it from this guy. He had 116 chapters. He had two additional chapters that are not in the Quran today. 
And so you've got those kinds of issues. Uh, apart from that, you have, in the Muslim sources, we read about entire chapters of the Quran being forgotten. Abu Musa in Sahih Muslim said, he goes and warns the, the professional reciters of Basra, um, hey, don't harden your hearts the way we did, and we forgot two entire chapters of the Quran. And he quotes, he says, I only remember one verse from one of the chapters, and the verse is not in the Quran. So he's talking about chapters. He's not just saying, hey, we forgot it, but other people remember it. He's saying, we all forgot it. So he, he talks about two entire chapters of the Quran uh, being forgotten. Uh, according to Aisha, Muhammad's wife, um, more than 100 verses came up missing just from Surah 33. This would have, this would have been uh, passages that were lost by the people who died in battle, and they couldn't find them anywhere afterwards. More than 100 verses from, from one chapter. Uh, Aisha also said that she had verses of the Quran, and she had the only copy, and she had them on a pillow, and a sheep came and ate them, and those verses are not in the Quran today. She, she names the verses, they're not in the Quran today. Why? She had the only copy, they were eaten. So this is a massively sloppy process. In addition to all of this, there's the issue of the Quran affirming the inspiration and the preservation and the authority of our scriptures. So when Muslims are saying, ah, look at, you know, you've got variants and so on, well, guess what? There were already variants in manuscripts of the Bible by the time of Muhammad, and yet Allah still affirms the gospel as the inspired, preserved, authoritative word of God. And Muslims think of it as, you know, some book that was, you know, given and then instantly lost somehow. No, Muhammad says that the Jews and Christians were still reading the Torah and the gospel during his time. He even commands them, Allah commands them, Jews and Christians, to judge by the Torah and the gospel even during the time of Muhammad. So, uh, in, in Surah 5, there's an interesting uh, situation. We know the historical background from the Hadith. But some Jews come to Muhammad to judge a dispute. And they say, Muhammad, you know, you're, you're the leader in the area. Uh, judge this dispute from, for us. The revelation comes from Allah. Surah 5, verse 43 of the Quran. Allah says, why are they coming to you when they have the Torah? Why are they coming to you when they have the Torah? And then the, the historical background that we find in the Hadith, when Muhammad gets that, he tells the Jews, bring me the Torah. And Muhammad is sitting on this judgment cushion. It's like a you know, judge's bench, but they had a special cushion that the judge of a dispute would sit on. So Muhammad's sitting on this cushion. The Jews bring out the Torah. Muhammad gets off the judgment cushion, puts the Torah on the judgment cushion, and says, I believe in you and in the one who revealed you. So the message there is the Jews don't need Muhammad. They've got their own scripture mm -hmm. that they are supposed to judge by. Just a few verses later in the same chapter of the Quran, Surah 5, verse 47, Christians are told that we have to judge by the gospel and that if we don't judge by the gospel, we're in rebellion against Allah. Ordering us to judge by the gospel and ordering Jews to judge by the Torah only makes sense if we have uncorrupted scriptures. If our scriptures have been corrupted and, full, and, and are now full of false doctrines, that makes no sense. You would say, no, you, they really need Muhammad because their scriptures have been corrupted. Not what the Quran said. Uh, even later in the same chapter, chapter 5, verse 68, um, Allah says that, Christians and Jews have no ground to stand upon unless we stand upon the Torah and the gospel. He's not even including the Quran there, right? It, it's the picture you actually get, Muslims can't get their minds around this because they, they would immediately spot a problem here. But the picture you get from reading the Muslim sources is this. If you, if you just read the Quran and you didn't have any outside input, you said, what is this saying? The message you get is that Allah has sent prophets into all the world. And prophets have revealed scriptures in different places in the world. People need scriptures in their own language that they can understand, otherwise they won't be able to understand it, or they would just have to trust someone else who's saying something in a different language and translating for them, but how do you know if you can trust him? And so people need a revelation in their own language. Allah sent prophets to everyone in the world. The Arabs were the last people to receive a revelation. That's why Muhammad is the seal of the prophets. Mm. It's not that he's, you know, super special in, 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 as far as the seal of the prophets. The seal of the prophets just mean everyone else had their prophet. These are the last group. Now they've got it, and he's the, so it's done. And so the message you get is now everyone has their revelation in their language. Everyone can judge according to their book and their language. The Arabs have to judge by their book and their language. That's the message. Problem was, later Muslims eventually went to the gospel and found it, wow, this doesn't line up. We were told it lines up. And so, up, oh, I guess everything else has been corrupted. Not what the Quran says. The Quran says no one can change Allah's words. So Jesus in the New Testament tells his fellow Jews, look at the Torah. 
because it points to me. And at a certain level, Muhammad was saying, hey, go to your scriptures. Mm -hmm. They bring the revelation.